We gather this morning to find joy and comfort in one another. Come, let us worship together. Life is a gift for which we are grateful. We gather in community to celebrate the glories and the mysteries of this great gift. Uh, please rise as you're willing and able for our first hymn, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. My life flows on in endless song of proverbs lamentation. I hear the real, the far off hymn that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? What through the tempest round me roars? I know the truth it liveth. What though the darkness round me goes, 
Songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm. While to the rock I'm clinging. Since love prevails in heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble as they hear the bells of freedom ringing, when friends rejoice both far and near, how can I keep from singing? To prison cell and dungeon file, our thoughts to them are winging. When friends by shame are undefiled, how can I keep from singing? morning. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome our friends at Ann Arbor UU who are joining us via Zoom this morning. So I've centered this service around a zine I made for a women's and gender studies class I took this year. This is the cover. So I called it Taking Up Sacred Space which is a feminism and religion-based play on words. So if you're wondering how college is going for me, I've never felt more at home. <laughs> but seriously, um, this cover is a take, my take on a phrase often heard in feminist or justice circles, and it's an encouragement to take up space. There are a few types of space to which they refer. We can think of physical or literal space that our body takes up in a room, how someone sits or carries themselves, who takes up the space at our chancels. We'll also reflect on metaphorical space, whose voice or opinions take up space in a conversation or which displays of emotion we respect or demean. And then of course, because none of this is binary, there's everything in between. This is the language we'll be using when talking about the history of feminism in our faith, the language of space. We will use this language to examine what UU women did with this entirely new space created for them when Unitarianism and Universalism merged in 1961. How they fit into religious power structures, how UU women fit into feminism, and just as importantly, how feminism fit into Unitarian Universalism. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian, Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. Environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We move now into a time of spiritual practice, starting with the sharing of joys and sorrows. We have one sorrow this morning submitted by Ed Sharples. While recently riding her bicycle, Judy Amir fell and damaged a bone in her back. She is recuperating at home. For all the joys and sorrows shared and unshared today, we hold you in our hearts. We meet on holy ground by Richard S. Gilbert. We meet on holy ground brought into being as life encounters life, as personal histories merged into the communal story, as we take on the pride and pain of our companions, as separate selves become community. How desperate is our need for one another, our silent beckoning to our neighbors, our invitations to share life and death together, our welcome into the lives of those we meet, and, our, and their welcome into our own. May our souls capture this treasured time. May our spirits celebrate our meeting. In this time and in this space, for we meet on holy ground. Sing with me. Sing with me. Sing with me. Sing with me, oh my soul. Sing with me. Sing with me. Sing with me, oh my soul. Speak for me, speak for me, speak for me, speak for me, oh my soul, speak for me, speak for me, speak for me, oh my soul. Today's reading is by Roddy Biggs, a queer BIPOC young adult EU writer. Though at times I may forget who I am or who becoming, my dreams, they matter. When I make space for all that is, when I move away from that which no longer serves me, when I make space for the new possibility in the circumstances, my dreams do matter. They matter. They hold many truths and many turning points. They matter. Though at times I may convince myself they don't, they do. For they call me back in time and forward still. My dreams matter. They matter as they pull me inward and yet simultaneously push me outside of myself. My dreams matter. They matter as they speak to the breadth of love, of pain, of hope, 
that rest deep in the fabric of my blood and bones. My dreams matter as they are connected to the dreams of my ancestors, connected to all who have graced this earth before, who grace it here and now, and who will be connected to and who grace this earth when I, when we, grace this place no more. My dreams, they matter. Your dreams, they matter. Our dreams, they matter. They matter. As I mentioned earlier, the zine that inspired this service was made for my Women's and Gender Studies final project. For this research, I read two particularly interesting papers looking at our history of activism as well as the makeup of our clergy. Our second reading comes from one of those papers called The Feminization of Unitarian Universalist Clergy by Dawn Sangri. Neither the militant feminists of the 1970s nor the worshipers of the goddess, nor the sp secular spiritualities of the new age will satisfy my longing for a religious tradition that is grounded in history and yet open to evolution and change. I have cast my lot with the free, liberal, Unitarian Universalist tradition as the best expression of that hope for a faith that is grounded and open, that has roots and wings. As a woman, as a minister, as a human, I want to work within this tradition to carry us forward together. Sometimes I don't like it But that don't mean I don't love it Sometimes I get down so low But that don't mean I can't rise above it Sometimes it's the vast and known As far as I can see And sometimes it feels like I'm touching everything Everything is touching me. I've lost people and money to become the woman I am today. And I'll still be becoming tomorrow. Maybe losing but choosing her anyway. I know it's a lot to look at all that I got. It's a lot to see who I am and I'm not. But I can laugh, and I can love, and I can sing, and I can do hard things. Look at my children. I wouldn't trade them for the world. And I've gained joy like I've never known, but lost the lightness when I was a girl. We're told to say that it's better and it is and it isn't and i know that there's little black or white little wrong or right and mostly it's both i know it's a lot to look at all that i got it's a lot to see who i am and i'm not but i can laugh and i can love and i can dream and i can do hard things Sometimes I can hold it all. I know where I end and where I begin. And sometimes it's all way too heavy and I'm way more than the sum of all my parts. I know it's a lot to look at all that I got. It's a lot to see who I am and I'm not. But I can laugh and I can love and I can dream. 
I can win, I can lose, it's all the same. I still dance and I'll sing in the pain. And I can do hard things. Former UUA president Paul Carnes once said that sexism is both an individual and an institutional, a spiritual, as well as a socioeconomic problem. Sexism as a spiritual problem, a spiritual problem that we are not inherently excused from. Our natural state is not for people of one gender to hold power all over all others. Discrimination and forms of oppression that privilege men are created and constructed purposefully. That work in organized religion is done through scripture or ritual, through position, people in positions of power. So when in 1961, Unitarians and Universalists merged, you, you women were left with questions about how to cultivate a religion that actively works against patriarchy. And there are a few groups that would emerge. The UU Women's Federation or UUWF, who were hesitant to describe themselves as feminists at the time, worked within three frameworks, personal, congregational, and societal action. They took on approaches that believed men and women had qualities inherently different to one another, but that the qualities inherent to women were also deserving of respect. <coughs> there was the Unitarian Universalist Ministers' Wives Association, who grappled with their role in, in a community as wives of ministers and used their husband's role to make positive change. However, inherent to their organization is the acceptance that ministers are men and men are married to women. There was, of course, a task force, the Women in Religion Task Force, which was part of the UUA, and worked to correct sexism in the religious structure through doable everyday initiatives. What is striking about much of this work is that it was inward focused. Obviously, there are feminist issues to be addressed beyond our congregants congregations, and religion. But there's also work to be done within ourselves. We do not create beloved community just by saying we are committed to gender equality. And luckily, we as you use find ourselves in a religion with a great capacity for growth. We are a living tradition. Our faith and understandings of who we are grow and change and are tested. So one issue that these groups zeroed in on was gendered language. And they found that hymns and readings and sermons would often use the word man when they really meant one or somebody, or they would use he, him pronouns when referencing God. These are maybe seemingly little ways to center the spiritual lives of men. But first, a quick refresher course in Unitarianism and Universalism. Unitarians believed that God encompassed the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so they deny the Trinity. Universalists believed in universal salvation. They deny that the eternal hell exists. And so they found when they were looking into their hymns and their readings, that there were a lot of references to the Trinity in hell, things that each group respectively did not believe in. And so they fixed that problem by revising their hymns and their readings that contain words that they didn't believe in. Words and language hold space around us. They change our understanding of ourselves and our beliefs. So if we know this to be the case, why would we let words that contradict our beliefs take up that space? So when you, you women recognize this issue with gendered language, they also saw how the work of changing the language we use is our history. Work that has strengthened our faith before and has the capacity to again. There were a few ideas about what to do here. One was using he, him pronouns when referencing God and she, her when referencing the mystery of life. So we would divide up spiritual concepts. So she, her, and he, him got roughly the same amount of time. This I find to be a particularly sticky solution. The issue is not 
that we need pronouns, more pronouns thrown into the equation, but rather we need ones that include all people, all of the time. It's not about overcorrecting and centering the spiritual lives of women, but thinking intentionally about the words and the readings we use. Sometimes the right reading has gendered language, and it means we call it out, and we acknowledge its presence, and we try to understand it in a new context. We are being inclusive and centering the spiritual lives of all while also growing through the lessons of our spiritual history. We are all affirming our beliefs that all genders are whole, holy, and good. And we're still doing this work, right? Understanding the ways that we introduce harmful gendered language into our sacred space. Understanding, more importantly, that using non-gendered language, discussing pronouns, keeping an open mind is vital to the health of our beloved communities. Maybe now it seems obvious that we shouldn't use he, him pronouns when talking about God, or we might think twice before using man, but this was a big issue for some people. One man wrote into UU World that the people behind these changes were just psychotic women. So if you're, while we're on the topic of some sexist language, there you go. But broadly, men in particular felt attacked at the suggestion that their religion could perpetuate sexism. And instead of understanding this as an opportunity to make necessary changes, this work was left up to the people who were personally affected by it. And we are always at risk of repeating our own mistakes. We have the opportunity, the privilege, of taking a critical look inward at our religion. Our faith asks a lot of us, and to put it ineloquently, I think that's really cool. Is it not the ultimate profession of faith to believe that our stories, our perceptions of ourselves, our belief in what is right will not crack, but be made stronger by our critical examination of them? I love this religion, and because of that, I see its potential to be better. I see our potential to be better. I see my potential to be better. And if this faith did not have the capacity to grow alongside of us, or was demolished by our thinking critically about our own history, I really do not think any of us would be sitting here today. Really, our faith would be an entirely different landscape without this critical lens. By 1999, 51% of UU ministers were women. In a world where some organized religions did not allow women to be ministers, still do not allow women to be ministers, 51% of ours were women before the 21st century even started. I don't have a more up-to-date number or an idea of how they might factor in the spectrum of gender now but I think that there's an important conclusion to be drawn nonetheless. The number, this number means that the space here, this space behind our chancel is occupied by women. And it's not a space that we just passively allow women to take up, but it is space that they have enthusiastically been occupying. Space that we have worked so hard to make all people feel comfortable and empowered to take up. I cannot and I will not tell you that we are a better religion solely because of the presence and leadership of women. I do not believe in feminine exceptionalism or that women are these uniquely extraordinary beings capable of more than people of other genders. But our religion is better because all people are empowered through ministry. The ministry done up here at the chancel the ministry done through our relationships with one another, the ministry of activism. And this ministry has changed us for the better. There has been a rise in collaboration and spirituality, openness and connection. None of these things are conditions within which the patriarchy can thrive. Patriarchy cannot survive through the election of ministers or the living tradition we have inherited the importance placed on lay leadership or our lack of creed. Patriarchy is not our natural state. It is constructed and created, which means it can also be dismantled and cracked. 
Maybe you've heard the phrase smash the patriarchy, um, which sure is fun, but really patriarchy cannot be smashed in one fell swoop. It is picked apart little by little and examined for fractures in its facade. Patriarchy is violence, but it is also competition. It's hierarchy. It's an emphasis on perfection. Patriarchy is blind faith in tradition and scorn for the spiritual. There is a lens that sees our activism as secular, which forces our holy work into that box. But I'm telling you, when I was doing this research, you, you women got it right pretty often. Um, sometimes more than these so-called secular feminists in the 60s and 70s. And I think that's because we see how holy this work is. And we know that the work that is holy to us is never finished. Today, this work grows into new roots, becoming comfortable discussing pronouns, widening our perceptions of the spectrum of gender, understanding how our biases can be harmful are all important and continuing the building of beloved communities. Intentionally creating sacred space for this inclusion to grow. Is this not the same work that the Unitarians and the Universalists and the UUWF have done all this time? Is this not work that they would want us to be doing right now? Intentionally protecting and cultivating our sacred space through words that affirm our faith through words that affirmed their faith, who they were and who they wanted to be. It is work that we are called to do and it is work that is steeped in who we are. Our last hymn is Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire, number 34. Though I may speak with bravest fire, and have the gift to all inspire and have not love my words are vain as sounding breath and hopeless pain though i may give all i possess and striving so my love profess and not be given by love within the prophet soon turn strangely thin come spirit come our hearts control our spirits long to be made whole let inward love guide every deed by this we worship and are free. Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so, amen, blessed be.